So it's uh, it's Friday. It's that time of the week again. And today I'm joined by James South. How are you doing, James? I'm I'm very well. Thank you. You? Yeah, I'm very good, James. Very good. good. Um, so uh, for some people who may or may not know you, uh, obviously you're kind of known as Mr. Mr. Image Processor, uh, which is obviously uh, something that's obviously now been bundled with uh, Umbraco for what the last year now has it been? I think it was 7.14, maybe it came in. So I think that was right. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, uh, yeah, so it's been a while. Like I mean, it was uh, yeah. I mean, we're coming up to Code Garden again. So yeah, a year now I'd say. Yeah, roughly about a year. Awesome stuff. Um, but yeah, rather than me kind of talk for you, uh, let's. Uh, how, how did you get involved with Embraco stuff? Um, well, I built an Embraco site ages ago, about four or five years ago, I think it was version four or something. Yeah. Um, it was all XSLT, and I didn't have a clue what I was doing because I'd only just started kind of you know, web dev, really. Okay. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I enjoyed it. The back office was easy to use. I'd used .NET Nuke, and it was an absolute nightmare. I'd used custom CMSs in the house, it was an absolute nightmare. And Umbraco, despite me not knowing XSLT in the slightest, uh -huh. was still good to do. It was, you know, everything just kind of worked, and, and, and it was it was it was great. And and what I really liked was the absolute control of the front end that I had, because you know I'm a real stickler for performance and things uh -huh. being clean and tidy. So being able to just have an empty thing to look at and, and put the code that I wanted in was was awesome. Yeah, I, I remember from my own personal experience that was the the key thing uh, for me was having 100% control of markup and uh, yeah, that that was the thing that, that won me over in the early days. Uh, but yeah, so that so that was four or five years ago. So uh, yeah, so was, so, was you, so was you building more on Broco size or was that just the one and kind of went away and then come back? Well, that was that was the first and the company I was working for at the time. We were doing we were starting to do more, but they kind of I don't know why, but they started going back towards .NET Nuke. Um, don't know why, because it, it makes no sense to me in the slightest. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, no offense, .NET Nuke, but no. Um, so uh, yeah, I I started building more and more, and I, st and I was recommended to to use Twitter for work because it was you know it was a great learning experience. Yep. And as soon as I hit the Umbraco hashtag, that was it. I started reading and. Chatting to folk and, and, and getting more into it. And, uh -huh. you know, it was such a, a such a friendly community that you know you can ask a question. You get ten people answering it straight away. Everyone's like, "Oh, brilliant! It's nice to see that you're trying this," and it's it's really cool. So, so yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's quite rare in unfortunately our tech industry. There's, yeah. not, many, there's not many communities um, that would. Uh, so willingly help one another. Uh, yeah. I know that your recent rants over the last couple of weeks yeah. has uh, been uh, quite hesitant towards Stack Overflow. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Stack Overflow has its ups and downs, but uh, um, yeah, they're, they're majoritively not, not friendly. They're, they're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> Grumpy devs. Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, you built Image Processor. So, so was Image Processor a project that you specifically, I know it, it doesn't tie uh, and can kind of live outside of Umbraco, but did you write it originally for Umbraco? Um, well, uh, or with that in was, mind? The first bit of imaging code I ever wrote was for an Umbraco site, but none of it was for Umbraco. Like, image processor lives on its own. The actual base binary can be used in a desktop app right. um, and, and whatnot. There's, there's two binaries. There's image processor and there's image processor.web. Right. And yeah. web is all the the MVC. Well, it's not even MVC. It's just a HTTP module that uh -huh. talks to the first one. And Umbraco uses that to talk to the base library to do its thing. Um, but yeah, the first time, I, first time I started doing any imaging code, oops, I killed you there. Hold on. Why not kill you? Um, the first time I started doing any imaging code was uh, for a cinema site, and we needed to resize thumbnails. I thought I can do that. Yep. And I wasn't actually a C sharp developer at the time, but I'd been uh, I've been playing around a lot with it. Okay. So yeah. I gave it a go, and it was it worked, but it was all in memory, and it wouldn't have been great. Uh, so I had to look around at all the various packages and things that were out there for for imaging, and and I needed something free, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like we all do. There's the other other ones, you know. It's I think it's important for people to learn crust, but I I, I couldn't afford. To use the packages that were there, yeah. and then he did something for myself. So 
I just started writing little bits and bobs of code, and then all of a sudden I got right into it. And and then more functionality came in, and, and the ability to do this, that, and the other appeared, and and it just grew arms and legs. And then uh, then the Embraco guys approached me, and I thought, Chris, this I better start making this really seriously now. <laughs> I better, I better, yeah, <laughs> better check it works properly. You know, I've been saying it does, but does it? So uh, yeah, uh, it's just it's you know it's turned into what I think now is a really polished piece of kit. Yeah, uh, yeah, you should. Pat yourself on the back. It's a good bit of work, and uh, yeah, it's something that yeah we all use these days, and it's a, a nice bit of work. Should be very proud. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Um, so over the last uh, week or so, uh, you've released a new uh, plugin for image processor. Mm-hmm. That's right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I'll let you uh, tell us all all about it. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it started off with yeah, you making a request on uh, on the uh, get <laughs> get hub. Yep. Yeah, it made me sweat a little bit. You needed a well, to explain to the audience. Image processor web uses a disk cache. Um, it pulls in the image, it caches it using an, a hash of the the request string, and plunks it in the directory, and then you know pulls up from the directory on subsequent requests. Um, that's great for a standalone website, but for uh, a cloud-based website or anything that you want to make really scalable, there's yeah. no point having separate caches for each one, and you're limited by your storage space on an Azure uh, cache by, I think it's, what, 50 gigabytes? Yeah, it's, it's, it's relatively limited. Um, yeah. If you're talking massive scale image-driven yeah, clients, then 50 that. gig is going to be hit pretty quick. Yeah, if you've got a big site that needs a lot of images processed, say it was a cinema website or something, you know, where yeah. thumbnails come in, yeah, there are services that they use to pull images from. They still want to tweak things. Um, if you were doing some of that, you want something that's scalable. So you want to be able to use blob caching, and this is what you asked me for. Yeah. Now, <laughs> at the time, the disk cache was really, really hard coded into everything. I'd, I'd kind of thought about doing a, an expansion on it and using it and making it pluggable. Mm-hmm. But I really wasn't sure how I was going to do it. Right. Um, but thankfully, um, you know, my brain was on uh, when I started doing it, so it came. Well, two days. It took t- two days, in all, all in all, to get from first line of code to finished product. Wow. Nice. Very very nice. Pretty pleasing. Um, I died. I had Javon as an inspiration down at Crumple Dog because. Uh, they actually, they've actually been very good to me, and and, and uh, they've they sponsored the, the the development. Yeah, I was going to say, didn't uh, I was speaking to Yevon the other day, and he was telling me that how uh, Crumple Dog uh, Gang had kind of sponsored this bit of work, so yeah. they needed it uh, in house for some website or project that they was working on, and it just yeah. made sense to hire the guy behind the Image Processor <laughs> yeah. and spend a month trying to write it themselves. Yeah, it's, it's 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 well, two days is better than a month, you know. So exactly. Um, yeah, it was, it was really great being able to get to do that and, and having other people to bounce ideas off was, was fantastic too. So yeah, um, we now have, uh, with the latest releases, mm-hmm. a pluggable cache system image processor the web. So I released the Azure cache plugin, yep. which we'll demonstrate in a moment. But if somebody wanted to build one for Amazon storage or mm-hmm. uh, you know, some other SQL blob storage or something, Yep. And they could go ahead and do that now, and they build the thing that would implement an interface. I've uh, designed, and, and away they go. They can they can cache Thank in you. whatever method they nice. want. Okay, um, so uh, I suppose I better talk you through. Yeah, should, the should we take, should, yeah, should we actually take a look at it? Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, right. I will do some screen sharing then. I'll show you the page. Oh, oh, I need to go to this tab first. Hold on. Screen share. Entire screen. Okay, right. Can you all see this? I certainly can. Yeah. Okay. So there's three images here. Yep. Um, one of them is just the standard penguins. <laughs> this is uh, a remote image that uh, Yevon's taken. I think this is one of his filters as well. And these are stored actually on a on a blob storage right now. Okay. So they're they're stored on blob storage. Um, both the source and when I twit switch on the cache, the cache will be also. So this is using the disk cache at the moment. 
Okay, and so this so this is just storing it relative to the, the site, uh, yeah, wherever the so site files lives. Okay, so yeah, this is the default the default setting, and we're storing from the disk. So if I bring up the the developer tools here, hold on, there we go. Um, I just hide this thing. I don't think it's annoying. So if I uh, refresh this page, for a second because I haven't used the app pool in a while. No worries. So I think it's rebuilding as well because I, I, I switched the, the cache over just before. Hello, computer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, right. Let's, uh, let's do that again so we get an absolutely realistic time scale. As you can see, we're pulling in, uh, we're pulling in the local file and we're pulling in some remote files from, these are pulled from a, a blob cache. They can be pulled from anywhere, remote, yep. local, any storage um, image source that you've set up. Because now there's, mine, there's the, the new, the iImage service interface, which means that you can you can pull an image from any location as well as, as uh, cache it in any location, which is okay. really nice. nice. Okay, so this, this first image is coming in. So we get the 200 request. Um, just refresh the page. Um, because the Chrome is being stupid and it's not doing a 304 on localhost, but it would do a 304. And if you um, hit the thing there, you can see they're all coming from cache. Yep. Uh, on on some sort of request, which is nice and nippy. Uh, if I open the cache in the other uh, the, the image in the other screen, you'd see remote cache, blah blah blah, and it would it would come out with the, the size. It would, it would just show the path to the image there. Yep. OK, so what now? What I'll do is I'll go into Image Processor, and I'll just show you quickly the, the markup here. So the first one, here's our, our, our local file. Yep. Here's a remote file. And we're just passing it a prefix in front of it to say, this is a remote file. That prefix is configurable. OK, I so if I want it to be, I don't know, I don't know. A different word, uh, yeah. Then, then remote.axd, then I can configure that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'll, uh, I'll just bring up in the. Uh, there we go. In, in security config, you can see there's prefix. Nice. There's the remote. Okay, so that's the remote image service that requires a prefix. You can change that to anything, but I use the axd because it doesn't get mapped by um, root handling by standard. So that's why I, why I keep with that. OK. And for anyone who doesn't know a little bit more about the security, you obviously add in that domain to a whitelist. So not, I, um, not, not that anyone can then just no, you can use your site as a proxy, so to speak. Yeah. So well, yeah, uh, nobody can use my system to you as a proxy if, for, for their images. They can only pull images that we assign on the whitelist here. So. Uh, Skin, you know, <laughs> but there's uh, there's our uh, there's our one here. You can actually be pretty unrestrictive on this uh, if you've got multiple subdomains or whatever. You can you can just pick one and it will check, you know, okay. the, the part there. Sure. Okay, so we've got our images. We're using the disk cache, and you saw that they were coming out and served. So what I'll do here is I've hidden the cache settings for the other off screen because it's got keys and stuff that I don't really want. Um, uh, be able to have to change because yep. using his cloud storage at the moment to demo this. So uh, I'll just control Z there because I already set up. And that is now using the Azure blob cache plugin. Okay. So Virtual. literally just by changing the attribute current yeah. cache. Yeah, that, that will switch it over. Now, the Azure blob cache, when you install it via NuGet, will install its own uh, configuration into the, the, the system. And it looks like this. You'll see the name, its type, how many days to store things in the cache. Okay. So here. once once it hits the the year amount, is it deleting the file automatically? It will clear the, the cache? File, yeah. Any any files that are expired from there, it will it will uh, replace the file with a new one. Right. And it will also because it's clean, it cleans up. When you save a new item on either cache system, when you save a new item, it will have a quick check to see locally if there's any. Um, Ones that the kind of like previous previous expired. caches. Yeah. yeah. So so it, it cleans itself as as it works. Um, right. It's very explicit in its search parameters, so it's it's very quick. 
uh, to do any cleanup, and it's also on a different thread anyway, so it doesn't stop your image getting served. Fantastic. Okay, so you can see here we've got the cache storage account, and that's just the standard settings that you put in um, when you're doing stuff with Azure anyway. You get the account key, you get the account name. Um, the name of the blob container that you're putting in. Yeah. This is the CDN root is uh, the root URL of where any where, where your CDN is that serves the actual final images. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that's empty, it'll pull it from the blob storage, but you don't want to do that anyway. You want to be still No, yeah, you do want to put a CDN. If you're going to be using blob storage, the point of it is to use a CDN domain on it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So these two values below that, storage account, and the blob container, um, what they can be used for is if you are serving your images from another blob container, um, so you've got a media one set up. Um, okay, yep. Image processor can check those blobs and make sure that they haven't changed. So um, if, if, if it makes a request, it can check that blob and say, well, that blob's not the same as it used to be, and it'll refresh the cache and clean it out. So it, it can check versioning of, of images. So if you put an image up with the same name and yep. it changes, it'll recognize that. But these are optional parameters anyway. Um, okay. Be used for that. Um, it's great if, uh, uh, say, in Umbraco, you're using the, the media section yep. um, with uh, uh, Dirk Seafield's um, Azure provider. Yeah, so there's a yeah, file system yeah. provider that can yeah. upload uh, the Embraco media to a blob storage. So yeah. I, I can set the source storage account and container yeah. to, be, uh, to be those, to, to point those values. values. Yeah, to those values. If somebody uploads the file with the same name into that container, um, we'll get it. We'll get the, the thing from there. Awesome. Um, okay, now, uh, well, I've switched this over. Um, I should have refresh the page in the background so I won't be rebuilding it, but I didn't. So we'll go back to um, we'll go back to here and we will refresh the page. It'll just take a moment because obviously IS is now rebuilding the site because we changed the configuration setting. Yeah. But that's no reflection on the cache itself. So okay. Okay, so we have three images coming in here. I'll just I'll just make sure that it's definitely pulling the right one. And if we go into network, come on, I inspect it, sorry. If I can look at the network now as I go through, you'll see a little bit of a difference. It's making the request for the images. Okay, yeah. Forming a 302, and then it's hitting. Oh, okay, so 302, and then it's giving you the CDN image to yeah, return. CDN image. So. Now, that was on a hard refresh. Um, okay. If I do a single one, it just comes from the cache. You know, there's nothing going on. It's been served with the correct headers. Everything matches up in, Real. Um, in uh, Azure to the settings that you define. So it'll cache for the amount of days that you want to cache for and whatnot. It's all set on Azure. And you'll see they're all the correct um, file types to send because that's determined by the parser with an image processor. And it's... And, that's pretty much infallible, the parser for that, because it reads byte arrays. So, so your, your MIME type should always be correct as well. You can see that, that, that does its thing. It worked. Uh, we have images coming from cache. And if I open the image in a new tab, see it will do the redirect. And there you go. So you can see the URL is, mm, nice. is the, the, the end. So, uh, say, I know this is not tightly coupled to Embraco, but obviously the majority, well, not the majority, but a, a large amount of people will use this with Embraco. So, say if I'm using the, the, the image cropper, where I can put a focus dot and generate all these crops, I presume if I was to change the focal point and save it in the, in the Embraco back office, uh, would then all the CDN get updated? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, because that, what well, when you change the focal point in a crop, yeah, the image cropper, you're actually changing the URL that gets sent. So anytime we're modifying the URL, a new request, and then in theory we get a new image stored in the cache and it set back. Yeah. Awesome. So if you actually look at the the file name, yeah. Yeah. 
highlight this bit here. That is uh, a hash of the full request. And then if you look at the characters that come from cache before that, E9365A, they're the first six characters of that, that hash. That's what, how it determines nesting of, of structures within directories, both on the file cache and in the blob storage. Okay. So it's always unique. If a new URL is fired, a new cache element is created, it knows what it's, you know, it, it always points to the correct item and you can never get duplication. Fantastic. Yeah. Very, yeah. very nice. Yes, it is. So yeah, the, I mean, the idea with this was to make it as simple to use as, as humanly possible. I don't want, I don't want developers to have to think about, you know, <laughs> writing code to do this stuff. They should be able to just install it and you get yep. the work. Yeah. So does this kind of ship with the native uh, image processor, or have I got to go and get another NuGet or another DLL? I'll just see if I can. I was the wrong one because it always brings up a shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing around with the JavaScript engine recently because I've been doing my nothing. So, uh, uh, I'll just go to my own packages. Manage my packages. Uh, there we go. Azure Blob Cache. Okay. So it's its own separate entity, and I presume as more either you write or the community writes, there'll be, like you say, an S3 blob cache. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah, I mean, I'd love someone to write a, a blob cache for us because I know absolutely nothing about it, and I'm not going to, you know, buy the storage to test it. So, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> contribute. People would be amazing. Yeah. Um, right, I'll stop screen sharing now. and. and so we can uh, so yeah, before you quickly jump off screen share, last quick thing, how easy is it, say if I've got some time and I know about some S3 stuff and I've got an S3 test account, how easy is it for me to write uh, a new pluggable okay. interface? Yeah. Okay. Um, right, well, let's, let's go to Visual Studio here and uh, load something up. This is a meaty solution now. Uh, in this process, uh, uh, plugins. There we go. I don't even know where my own stuff is. <laughs> this is one file. Oh, literally a single class. This is a single file that's implementing an interface, which I will go to. I'll just zoom in here so we can see what we're uh, doing. Um, it implements uh, uh, an interface. Yeah, that, so image cache by image. Yeah. Hi, image cache. So, uh, image back cache base. Sorry, if you use image cache base, yep. that makes it a lot easier for you. It's a public file, and um, it pulls all the configuration file settings for you. And as you can see, a lot of this stuff is asynchronous. So, and, and it does things like creates the file name for you from the hash, which is makes things a lot easier. You know, you can you can, you can use all these base methods for your your implementation. Fantastic. Um, Go to the interface itself because it is pretty simple. If you do feel the urge to do your own stuff, which I would, I would strongly recommend everyone uses the base cache for everything. So yeah, it, it makes sense if you've kind of thought about uh, the stuff that needs to happen under the hood, like yeah. the, the common stuff. Then why, why, why use what, anything why? else? So you can see they're all asynchronous. Um, uh, methods here for the most part because we're pulling stuff from remote files, we're talking to remote services, um, pulling from the file stream and whatnot. We, we want things to, to, to you know, not be blocking in any way. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so there's the base file and um, it's got a few methods in it. No, there's more comments than code to be honest with you. And in the blob cache itself, um, a couple of regular expressions, simple stuff. Yeah. Um, we initialize the the values. For the when this is all just using the the SDK for, for oh, Azure. Azure, yeah. yeah. Um. Uh, I, new or is new or updated? Okay. A bit more complicated, but you could use this as the basis for anyone that you write. Yeah. And all these all these providers offer the same basic mechanism. I'm sure you know. <laughs> yeah. Anyone has an original idea most of the time in code nowadays. We we we, we 
find something that works and we copy it. Yeah, and that's, that's the best way for us really as well for the most part because you know it means we, we, we have a, a repeatable patterns. Um, but yeah, so it's it's it. None of this is difficult to write. It really isn't. Um, it just took a bit of thought to get it all going and just strip out the old code okay. from uh, the HTTP module. But uh, yeah, you could write your own. I reckon if you know what you're doing with the SDK of, of whatever provider you're doing, you probably do one in an afternoon. I okay. reckon. Awesome. Yeah. I expect to see some crop up over the next few weeks. I would imagine. Yeah, I would. I would recommend people if they look at the cache file that I've created. Yep. Use that as a template for their ones, and they should be able to build one, build one pretty quickly. Awesome. Okay. All right. Uh, so, is there before uh, before we jump off screen chat one last thing? Is there anything specific uh, that's been added to Image Processor recently that you kind of like? Uh, this is because I, I, I see quite a few tweets from you every now and then. You go, oh, I've like, spent some more time on some kind of maths and done some this fancy <laughs> yeah. image processing. And I can now do this X Y Z or whatever. Well, uh, there, there was there was a bit of cleanup inside just to to optimize a bit of the, the garbage collection and stuff. I wanted things to be. You know, memory usage is, is limited on a server. Mm -hmm. um, if it's your own server, you know, um, .NET loads images in memory when it processes them. So if you don't have enough memory, things blow up. And I get the odd request saying things are blowing up, but it's usually because they're working on a 32-bit machine and they can't, you know, they can't utilize the amount of memory required for right. processing megapixel images, which people are trying to do with this. This can do it, but you need memory to do it. And that's just how .NET works. So so people are just throwing massive files at it, yeah. expecting it to just work on a shitty machine shoved in the corner. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, well, or even just a you know a desktop that's thirty-two bit, you you stuff stuffed, stuffed really. You know, you, you can't you can't do big images on that. So I've been doing some work just to ensure everything's as tight as possible with that. But I've been messing around with things like CMYK half toning and stuff. Okay. Um, do you have a demo of that? I might be able to. <laughs> Hold on. Or is it work in progress? No, no. I've got, I, I think it, uh, we'll just see whether it works. <laughs> uh, um, How about be really crazy? Why don't you modify one of the images in your CDN remote? Uh, so, like yeah. the resize the remote. Why don't you? Why don't you okay, so add a query string onto either one of them, and then you can obviously show your fancy. Azure CDN. Yeah, I'm just trying to remember the syntax because I've not written the documentation <laughs> for this bit yet. Um, uh, I think it's just that. And half tone. Mm, two seconds. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> flip, over, flip over to the source. Let's let's do it by. We, we can have a wee look at the source here. Uh, processes. Half tone. I just need to see what my thing is. I've done, I, I've been having a nightmare. Uh, oh yeah, so half tone or half tone equals comic. You can do an overlay to the top of it. So we'll do a half tone one first because it's a little less processor intensive. So we'll save that. So that uh, was the third image, yeah. So it was a tree. Oh, I don't know which one is it. Hold on, that's the uh, that's the second one. No, the third one. You're right. The third one. So the tree. Which is a massive image. Hold on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't the best one to try on. We'll see. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I had to up the uh, security settings to allow bigger files to allow this one to download. So. Okay. So, um, okay. The other two have come in because they've just pulled out the cache. That loading time was just the, the, the view recompiling stuff mostly. Now, this isn't going to be a quick method because half toning is really expensive. Um, I'm, I, I don't know if you know much stuff about this, but uh, uh, CMYK is, is an additive uh, color system. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you uh, add the colors together to get black, where um, so well actually there you go. There's there's a, there's oh, yeah, so squint at it. You can see it's still a tree, and it's, it's got some cool. Uh, Cool dots. Um, basically, what I've done is I've split it all up into the four components. Um, so you're, you're splitting the image up in terms of this is yes yeah, cyan, magenta, uh, whatever the CMYK yeah, colors are. Yeah. yeah, the K means uh, 
key line, um, and that's just black. And what I do is I do them at different angles from each other. And you take the amount of each color from uh, from each pixel at each point. I'm, I'm doing a distance of six pixels. I can't remember off the top of my head. So there must be some crazy maths in terms uh, of trying to try and replicate uh, an effect if you're talking that uh, each pixel is talking knows relative to pixels around it. And uh, well, no, no, it's actually. To, to do this one, it's not so bad. Um, what you need to do is rotate a point. You need to use a bit of trigonometry to do that. So the, the, when you're dotting your point, you turn it. I like the way you just talk about it so casually. Oh, just a bit of trigonometry. <laughs> yeah. I'm terrible at maths, honestly. Um, I really, really, really wish I'd studied a bit harder at school because uh, I've forgotten everything I ever learned. Um, so you rotate. You do a bit of rotation of the points to to rotate round. Um, because each one's at a different angle to stop um, uh, mooring effects. Mm -hmm. and I need to calculate the size of an image at the maximum it could possibly be in each dimension on rotation as well. So there's a little bit of maths of that. But I've actually got maths helpers but written into image processor now that do all this stuff for you. So, um, yeah, so that's a new effect. That's just a, a toy, really. Yeah, it's nice, though. Um... Again, it's uh, it's all pluggable and it's open source, so you people could kind of read how that processor was written, and if they wanted to make uh, their own processor, then yeah, I mean all the processors and the web processors are all pluggable. Everything from there is. I've just had the comic overlay to that so that you can see what that does, um, and it's going to be lightning fast. It's, it's, so yeah, as I say, the initial request in terms of processing and. Figuring it yeah. out, and then, and then putting it up to blob, and then returning, returning the blob. Any, any subsequent requests is, is nice and quick. So I, you know, I'm pulling the thing, and I'm doing this really quite processor-intensive bit of code on it at the moment. Um, this is probably the most processor-intensive method I have. So, um, so yeah. So there we go. We've got it there, yeah. and there's the comic book version. So I, I use a bit of edge detection to to pull that out. I think the effect's really cool. You know, it's, no, yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah. Um, there's another method that's been added, uh, rotate bounded. Um, okay. Normally, if you rotate a, an image using image processor, mm -hmm. it will expand the canvas to fit the dimensions of the rotated image. Because if you rotate something that's wider than it's long, all of a sudden the image needs to be taller than it used to be. Yep. Um, there's a new one that I was asked to, to add, and there was some more complicated maths involved in this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that what it does, it rotates the image. Now, it Could we try on either one of the smaller ones at the top? So we haven't got a processor, a massive file. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, um, See what, I'll stick two underneath each other. Yeah, a comparison. So the first one's the original kind of rotate method, and the one below is the new yeah, one. The original's rotate. I just want to double check my syntax again because again I've not done the docs for this. I'm using Jekyll for the docs and it's making me cry. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, again, help me if you can, people. Yeah, no, of course. I've written a lot of documentation. I've really tried hard in it, but you know, it, I could always do with more. And it, and it, it really does make me cry to use Jekyll. So. Surely there's oh. an alternative. Oh <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if that uh, book library thing takes off, I can just pull it off from there and do it in an Umbraco one, which would be much much better. Yeah. Okay, so that's rotated. So rotated, obviously, yeah, adds like a, a, a coloured background or black background. Well, what it does, actually, this, this is yeah. a, another query that I get quite a lot. Why is there a black background on JPEGs um, when things are padded and whatnot? Well, you can't have transparency. Exactly. You've exactly. got to set a background colour to be white to try and match your, your surrounding background. You know, I, I'm not going to set a default colour because then that gets overloaded. So what I do is I keep the, the default, which is the .NET one, so you, you get what you expect out yeah. of it. So, uh, so yeah, so rotate. It's expanded the canvas, as you can see, to fit the dimensions of the rotated image because it's changed. Yep. The one below it is a smaller image. And what that's, the reason it's smaller 
is because it's looked for the smallest rectangle that can possibly fit. At 45 the, degrees, yeah? Yeah, yeah that, it's at 45 degrees, yeah. It's the smallest rectangle that can fit the image where there's nothing cut off. Okay, nice. So it's get the image to the image. Now, there's an overload for this where um, you can keep the original directions as set because we actually said width is 45. And we want, say we want um, the so, dimensions yeah, that's to so actually... So now the width is not really 400 anymore, like you said. Is there a exactly, way to yeah, say so that you, the width is definitely going to be 400 and it's going to be bounded in the rotation? Yeah, so let's copy this. Yeah. Um, Keep science. Uh, and we'll take bounded keep size equals true. Okay, so um, there should be another image that pops up underneath now. No. Okay. Again, this is an image processor being slow. This is uh, yeah. You've just modified the the site. Did I save that? Mm, I'm pretty sure you did, didn't you? Oh, there it is. Sorry, oh, oh, yeah. there it is. That's the original dimensions. What it actually does is it zooms the image. Okay, so to ensure that the dimensions are kept, but it, no cutoff is visible. So you can see it's the same image with the same proportions, and the same uh, parts, but but uh, zoomed in to match it. Uh, that was a very specific requirement that uh, a French fellow that's been helping me greatly with the library. Mm -hmm. As before, because um, uh, he's got this picture. He works for a company that that uh, makes pic photo albums that okay. you can upload, and then they need this for that. So, so yeah. So there was a bit more mass than that because you've got to calculate what zoom <laughs> to uh, zoom it into to ensure that the dimensions map and stuff. But that that's a new functionality that's been added. No, uh, that's very very nice. Yeah. But and and there's there's tons and tons of processes at all. Yeah, oh, there's, there's, there's a good yeah, there's a good substantial amount of processes that are available. Yeah, there's also one more um, I've just remembered, which I'll yeah. show you. I'll edit the first picture again. Uh, do, 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 do. So let's say we set a height on this. So uh, height equals five hundred. Right, that's gonna. Uh, screw up things. We're going to end up with a padded image. Yep. Because uh, the default mode, as everyone probably knows by now, is, is uh, resize mode pad. Resize mode pad. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. You can see it's padded. Now, we can actually change the anchor point of this now. This was something that you couldn't do before. So now what, can I can set the, for it to be padded to at, or anchored at the top and all the padding sits at the bottom? Yeah, yeah. So, so you can do that now. Again, I just need to. I actually need to check my documentation. <laughs> <laughs> so much of this stuff that um, yeah, I do forget it. Uh, come well, on. That, that's a good problem to have. It is a good problem to have. But so this is the the new site. Um, uh, da -da -da -da, image processing module. Uh, Resize. There we go. <laughs> Resize and anchor. There we go. I thought it was as simple as that, but I couldn't remember. So, say we want to anchor it to the top. Um, that's loud. <laughs> Ta da! Sweet. So you see, it's a tank to the top now. So that actually matches the behavior that we got with crop mode. Because you can defaults by center. You can, with, with the crop mode version of resize, you yep. could tell it to crop to uh, top right, bottom, or left, or it will default by center. But now that matches on, on pad mode as well. So Fantastic. the functionality is the same. But yeah, so that's, an, that's three new bits of, of, of toys that are. That have been thrown into it to, to, to see what's happening. 
have to give it a go. Fantastic. Okay. No, that's been a, right. a, a, a great demo. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, let's see, are there any questions by anyone or anything? Um, let's just take a quick look. Um, I know uh, there's been a, there's been a couple of comments um, about your beard. It, the, the, there's there's been some envious, <laughs> envious comments about your beard. I think uh, you're you're trying to beat uh, Matt Brailsford in the in the beard beard competitive. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I could do that, but uh, uh, there's a I'm I'm getting married at the end of May, and Emma wants me to have a big beard for it, so I'm Excellent. not going to shave till then. So by then it should be a good five month. Uh, it should be a big, big thing. So. Big bushy beard. Awesome. Yeah, I might just keep it for half because I'm really enjoying it. So, so. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, actually, it doesn't actually look like we've actually got any questions, but there's a lot of people been watching. So I presume the demo has actually been relatively self-explanatory. Then um, I think you've taken us through a nice journey in terms of uh, how, yeah, the plugin. Cash module um, is now pluggable, and we can all now write our own uh, providers and uh, start plugging yeah. weird and crazy uh, <laughs> external sources that we need to. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you can you can create any image source, and you can create any image cache now with image processor. So, um, you know, you can pretty much do what you want with it um, now, as far as that, that goes, yeah. as long as you follow the interfaces. So, so just just talking uh, crazy idea. So you're saying image sources and interface. So in theory, I could use some API to draw something like Flickr or something to get that as the source or something similar. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like obviously. based on some weird convention that I want to use. Yeah, yeah, you could. I mean, whatever whatever convention that you want to have, as long as you can provide a byte stream to the image processor, then. That's it. It can it can process it and, and pump it out. Obviously, exactly. Flickr, you could just put the URL to Flickr. Yeah, exactly. Well. Yeah, that that, that would be the more simpler one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you're pulling from a database or, or you have a restricted folder that you want to pull images from, say you, you want to store them in that data or something, mm -hmm. uh, you can do that. Okay. Um, nice. Um, but yeah, no, thank you very much, James. It's been great chatting to you, and um, I look forward to playing with some of the new image processing toys. Cool. Brilliant. Let me know how you Yeah, we'll do, James. Excellent. Have a good one. Catch Thanks. you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.